Well, in 1956, January 6th of 1956, a group of American missionaries led by a man named Jim Elliott welcomed three members of an isolated tribe on a small beach in the jungles of Ecuador. The encounter there was in many ways the culmination of years of planning and praying and studying. It was the moment it felt like maybe that, that everything had led to. Almost four years prior to that, on February 2nd, 1952, Jim Elliott had stood and waved goodbye to his parents as he boarded a ship for Quito, Ecuador, and South America, having just graduated from Wheaton College in 1949. There in Ecuador, Jim, along with several other missionaries, would study the language and prepare to take the message of the gospel to the Aucas tribe. It was a tribe that was known for its deadly violence and had murdered anyone who tried to make contact with them. And yet these missionaries convinced of God's calling on their life, the mission that God had placed before them were committed to pursue these people with the gospel. Three years later, Jim and four other Ecuador missionaries would do just that on that beach. Nate Saint, who was a missionary pilot with the group, uh, he had uh, come up with a way to lower a bucket from the plane. To, he would lower, lower supplies there on the ground from, while flying around above them and felt like this was a safe way to kind of say, hey, we're friendly, have free stuff, and not put themselves in danger. He wanted to demonstrate to this tribe with such a history and reputation of violence that they meant no harm and they weren't putting anyone in danger without putting themselves in danger as well. On September 1st, 1955, that plan became a reality. And through the use of a bucket flown from an airplane, they began dropping gifts to the AUKUS. They also had an amplifier there that they would use as they would speak out and shout out uh, friendly AUKA phrases, at least the ones they knew. After several months of this, the AUKUS actually sent a gift back up uh, the bucket in the plane. And at this time, they felt like, hey, now's the moment. Now's the moment to, to have this friendly encounter that we have hoped for and finally meet face to face. So one day as they were flying over, Nate Saint, the pilot there, had noticed a beach in that territory that looked long enough for him to actually land the plane on. And so they had made a plan. He landed there and one by one, he would drop off those missionaries there on the beach. The men there built a little tree house, which sounds awesome, like every little kid's dream. And they stayed in that tree house and they would wait until contact would be made. In the meantime, Nate would fly over and around the village there and he would call them to come to the beach to meet them. And after four days, finally, one Aka man and two women appeared. The missionaries, knowing only a few Aka phrases of communication, clearly and obviously found it difficult uh, to communicate there, and, uh, but they did share a meal together trying their best to make friends and befriend this group that they felt so burdened for, so called to come to, and yet had this reputation of, of not making friends well, to say the least. But they continued. In fact, Nate even took, one, took the man in the airplane and flew him around. Uh, so, you know, that's brave. <laughs> They tried every way they knew to show sincere friendship. And then they asked them as they returned back to the village that when they came back to bring more with them. And so for the next few days, the missionaries waited for other AUKUS to return. And finally, on day six, 
two Aka women walked out of the jungle. Jim Elliott and another one of the missionaries named Pete see them coming out of the jungle uh, with excitement, anticipation of all that God would now finally do, rush into the river to greet and meet them, but it didn't take long for the two to realize this wasn't the friendly meeting they had hoped for. Now, now prior to this encounter, they had had a lot of discussions about what it would look like to meet such a people that had such a history of violence and what lengths would they go to to defend themselves against this people group if things happened to turn south. And they had all together said, we're not gonna harm them. In fact, Jim is known for saying, I'm ready to meet my maker, but they are not yet. And so despite being armed with pistols, they were convinced not to use them. And as they stood in the river and pleaded with these people, trying to explain what they were doing, they died at the hands of the very people they came to reach. Jim Elliott was 28 years old. And yet... This mission, by all worldly accounts, was an utter failure and waste of time. Everyone would look at that and say, what a tragedy. And yet, when it comes to the mission of God, things are not always what they seem. Not all is what it appears to be. And we get to Philippians here, the study of joy. And we pick up this morning in chapter one, verse 12, and we find even with the apostle Paul that what appears to be one way isn't always the case with God. So read with me here. Philippians chapter one, verse 12, the apostle Paul says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, he says, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing even that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether by false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul, the example before us and the word of God that we have. I pray over the next few moments, you use it to both encourage and convict and we might find joy in living in such a way that we view the mission you've called us to as the priority of our life. That you might shift our perspective and draw us to you, mold and shape us more into the image of your son who came and gave his very life for us so that we might not just survive this thing on earth, but live it abundantly. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I've always found it kind of ironic in the book of Philippians, right? The Apostle Paul, if you were here last week, you you learned, you heard Pastor Todd say, he's writing this letter to the Philippian church from prison. (laughs) And he's writing to encourage them You would think it'd be the other way around. You'd think the Philippian church would be writing to the Apostle Paul saying, hey, buddy, don't give up. We're praying. It's gonna be fine. We got a plan. We're gonna break it out, you know? Like, you think there'd be something. But instead, we find the Apostle Paul here imprisoned for his faith, something he makes very clear here. And yet, he's writing to encourage those who are not. 
things are not always as they seem. And I love that he even says, like, what has happened to me has actually been for good. It's not what it seems. Those who maybe would look at him in prison or maybe even placed him in prison in some ways thought this will finally quiet the movement that he is a part of. The message that he continues to spread, finally put this guy in jail, put him away and make it stop. And yet the apostle Paul says, but that's not what's happened. That's not what's happened. And so there's a few things I think we learned from the Apostle Paul in regards to our joy this morning that we find here in this text. And the first one is this, that when we live with the priority of the mission that God has called us to, it reframes our circumstances. When we live with the priority of the mission, it reframes our circumstances. Now, whether you're here in Victorville or you're at Apple Valley or you're in Hesperia or Phelan this morning, you walk into the room that you're sitting in with a mess of circumstance. And we would be fools this morning to think that the people that God has strategically placed on the front row of our life aren't watching us as we navigate those circumstances, whether good or bad. When good comes your way, are you quick to offer praise? But when bad comes your way, you're quickly questioning and blaming God. And the inconsistency of that, is it noticed by those who do not yet know him on the front row of your life? And here the Apostle Paul reminds us that, look, your circumstances, that we have to view our lives through this mission that God has called us to. It's where joy comes from, that it's not rooted and grounded in the circumstances that we face. Because listen, the circumstances you find yourself in today will not necessarily be the circumstances you'll be living with two weeks from now or six months from now or a year from now. And where will you be and how will you be then? And so it reframes our circumstances. So write this down in your notes. This isn't there, but we need to see our circumstances as opportunities and not obstacles. We need to see our circumstances as opportunities and not obstacles. Maybe, maybe you're in a job you don't like or you work with people who make it very difficult and you see that as an obstacle for your faith rather than an opportunity of the mission that God has called you to. Maybe your marriage is in trouble and you see that as an obstacle to your happiness rather than leaning in and working towards reconciliation so that it is an opportunity for those around you to see what that looks like, for God to restore. Maybe it's a diagnosis that you feared or didn't see coming and you see that as an obstacle rather than something that God could use for an incredible opportunity. Maybe you're in school and a school that you didn't want to be in or or a school you'd rather not be in, but in this season of life, it's where it has you and you see that as an obstacle and not an opportunity or maybe your housing situation isn't quite where you thought it would be or your career isn't where you'd hoped it would be or you just seem like you're not sure what you're doing and yet it's easy for us to look at those things as obstacles and the apostle Paul reminds us that hey listen even from prison this is an opportunity We need to see those things that we so often, that the world would view as obstacles and we look at them as opportunities because when we live with the priority of the mission, it reframes everything and it allows us to lean into the joy that God provides even through those things. So we need to see that. But second, this, you need to see that our circumstances are a part of the bigger purposes of God. The circumstances you find yourself in, these are bigger than you. They're bigger than you. I grew up in the South, we talk a lot in sermons. It's kind of a thing. I've learned not as much here and that's okay. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person to your left and say, uh, your obstacle is an opportunity. You see that, isn't that fun? Look at that. Introverts are like, no, okay. 
Now turn, now turn the person on the other side and said, God's up to something big and you're a part of it. Listen, when we live focused on the mission that God has before us, all of a sudden it doesn't become about us. Do you understand? The apostle Paul here sitting in prison said, listen, this isn't about me. That God is using this obstacle for something greater and bigger. It's become an opportunity so that the gospel would advance, so that those who would not have been reached are now being reached. And I'm recognizing that God is up to something bigger than just simply sticking me in a jail cell. And so it reframes our circumstances. Second is this, not only does it reframe our circumstances, but it also reaches non-believers, reaches non-believers. He says in verse 13, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. It reaches non-believers. Here the apostle Paul is finding himself literally chained to a Roman guard all the time. I mean, can you just imagine, uh, you, you've, you've been in circumstances, situations where you have people that just never stop talking and you're like, man, just take a breath, please. Whew. Some of y'all have kids like that, right? Like, I love you, but I stopped listening a long time ago, right? Like, <laughs> I love my girls, man. They talk a lot more than me. And there are moments where I get in the car with my daughters and I'm driving and at a certain point I realize they're still talking and I have... <laughs> I have no idea what, where, how we got here, right? Like, sometimes I'm like, look, I love you, but can we just get to the end, okay? Like, there's a point coming, and I'd like to hit it before I die, okay? Like, and here the Apostle Paul, in prison, chained to a Roman guard, and all this Roman guard can do is listen. Like, he can't even plug both ears, because one's chained to the Apostle Paul. He's got to take turns, I, maybe they're stuffing stuff in the helmet. I don't know. How do you do that, right? And yet the Apostle Paul finding this as this opportunity, and here are Roman guards who would otherwise have no access to the gospel, who are being reached through the testimony and the example of the Apostle Paul's life. Roman leaders coming to speak to Paul. And I can't even imagine the difference of Paul as a prisoner and all of the others. Like if I'm a Roman guard in that circumstance, like, whew, man, when everyone else is cursing me, you seem to be praying for me and blessing me. When everyone else seems obstinate and difficult, you're singing songs about things I don't even understand. Everyone else He's worried about Caesar and you proclaim this king of kings who has died and risen? Like, what is this? What is this? Listen, when you and I live with the mission that God has placed in our life, it will reach the people that God has placed in our life. I'm convinced of this. I think one of the reasons why we actually don't share Jesus with people in our oikos, the people in the front row of our life, isn't because we don't care for them, it's because we don't even notice them. We just go through our day, we're so concerned about us and what's next and what's waiting and what's, we're so worried and anxious about all the things in the future that we don't recognize that, man, hey, whoa, God has put this person right here for you. He's put these people next to your house. He's put these people in your workplace. He's put these people like at the coffee shop you stop at every day. They've memorized your order and you haven't even learned their name. Like you brag about the fact that I walk into this, I go into the coffee shop, my coffee's already made. I don't even I just have to wait in line really just to pay. They already know my order. Like you go there that much and you're like, but you know nothing about this person who knows more about you. Like God has placed people right there in your life 
And they're watching and they're listening and you don't even recognize that they're there. The Apostle Paul says, listen, when we live missionally minded, and that is a priority in our life, our circumstances that we find ourselves in, they become reframed for us and we see those as opportunities and we begin to finally notice the people that God has placed in our lives for the sake of the gospel. And when we live the mission out in front of them, they then re are reached. They come to know Christ and experience the same joy and peace and hope and forgiveness that we know through Jesus. And so when we live with this priority of mission, yeah, it reframes our circumstances, but the non-believers are reached as well. Number three, when we live with the priority of mission, it renews believers. It renews believers. The great irony in this, in verse 14, he says, because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. You would think again, Oh my goodness, the Apostle Paul's been arrested, he's in jail, it's over, run. But no, that's not what happens. They're like, look, he's in prison, he's writing to us, he's telling us of all the things that God is doing in spite of this moment. Man, if, if he can do it, what's keeping us? And so all the more now, they're leaning into this idea of living missionally. It's encouraging the believers that are around. When the people in your life who are already believers begin to watch you take your faith and the mission seriously, then they are rallied to come around you as well. As a student pastor, I've watched this happen in families for over 23 years Parents, as you begin to not just talk about Jesus on Sunday and show up because you have to and make sure you get your coffee and you come passively to receive and check the box, but lean into what it looks like to really live out your faith on a daily basis, your kids are watching that. And they see that and it's caught, man. They, incur they are encouraged to live that out as well. The influence that a parent has on their kid, it cannot be overstated. Some of us have done a better job in us, okay? Like I got one kid, she's with me, man. Like I have done a really good job of discipling a Tennessee fan in my home. Like really good, really good, passionate. And I hope and pray to God that my kids are just as passionate and I'm doing just as good of a job when it comes to Jesus. Right? Like. I have to be careful because all of a sudden I realize, man, the game comes on at 3.30, we gotta get home now. But am I so passionate to be at church, gathered with God's people? Like, man, church starts, we gotta go, get in the car. I don't care if you're dressed. Put a shoe on at least so it looks like we tried. <laughs> like, am I so passionate about that? Am I so intentional about that? It, the influence that we have, it's remarkable. And the people in your life, even if you're not a parent, the people in your life around you that you work with or that, that you interact with, they're watching. They're watching. This is what happened with, with Jim Elliott. Amazingly, right? Word of Jim Elliott and the other missionaries' murder makes it back to Wheaton College where Jim had graduated from. And all of a sudden, there's a sort of revival among the missionary effort that students now emboldened to also go and take the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And they would go, they would go. And so here's my challenge for you, if I can give you an action step from this moment, this point specifically. Hey, this afternoon at lunch or over dinner, Man, take some time as a family or take some time with some friends and share. What is God doing right now in your life? How are you seeing him honor the mission that you're living out? Or, or maybe you're not living it out very well, but you want to. What are, the, what are some goals that you have? That, and and thought, talk through, think through, what are some practical ways this week that we can live this out? 
so that we can not only reach those that God has placed on our life, but we might encourage others around us. And so it reaches the unbeliever and it renews the believer. Number four, when we live with the mission as a priority, it requires humility. It requires humility. It's crazy to me when I read this to think, okay, here's, here's the apostle Paul imprisoned for his faith and yet he's the one doing the encouraging. And I would like to think, if I'm honest, like, man, if I were ever put in prison because of my faith, that I would stand firm and do the same, believing that I'm here for something bigger. I can endure this because the gospel is bigger. Jesus is better. He is worthy of whatever I would deal. Like, I would like to think that. But I think what's crazier is when we get to verse 15, he says, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely. They suppose they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. His response in verse 18, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether by false motives or true, Christ is preached. He says, listen, don't miss what he's saying. Here I am in jail. And, and, and the gospel is being preached beyond me. And some of the people that are proclaiming it are doing so out of love. They recognize that I'm here because of my faith and their motives are true and pure. And they long to take the mantle and run towards the lost, advance the mission. But there are others, he says, that are doing so out of envy, rivalry. In fact, they intend to do me harm while I'm already in prison. It's like, man, kick a man while he's down. And he says, so what? Listen, as long as the gospel's being preached, that's a win. Now, that attitude, I don't know how I'd land on that one. Right, the humility of the apostle Paul to say, look, this isn't about me. Yeah, they mean to do me harm, but I'm not upset at that because the end goal is that the gospel is being preached and it is. And so if I have to be the man they kick while I'm down, I'll take it as long as people are hearing the gospel. Oh, I mean, whew. this is a check, right? An ego check. And it's, here's what's crazy. He's not critical of the message. It's not the, that the gospel they're preaching is wrong. He addresses those people later in the letter. The message isn't the problem. It's their motive and their attitudes that stink. And yet the humility of a man already imprisoned for his faith to sit and say, Jesus matters more. Jesus matters more. Ooh. I hope I could say that. I hope I could say that. So it requires humility. And so if you and I are gonna live with the mission, the priority of this mission that he's given us and experience the joy that comes through this, right? That when we live this way, it reframes the circumstances that we are in. It's gonna reach the non-believers that God has put in our path. It's gonna renew the believers that are surrounding us. It's gonna require of us to live in humility. And number five, it's gonna result in joy. Results in joy. Very last phrase in verse 18 in our section. And because of this, I rejoice, right? He says, but what does it matter, verse 18? What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. You know, I think one of the reasons we struggle so much as believers to live with joy is because we've forgotten why we're here. We've forgotten what the point of all of this is. We've forgotten what it means. When Jesus comes and says, I come to give you life and life more abundant, it's not I'm coming to give you more stuff. We can chase stuff 
and chase it and chase it and buy it and buy it and buy it. And then one day we die and we're buried six feet under, worms munching on our carcass and our loved ones who loved us dearly take it to Goodwill. And then someone else buys it for a dollar. But we think that having more will bring more. And Jesus says, no, less is more. It's me you need. It's purpose you need. It's a mission you need. It's being used by God to do things that you can never, ever imagine. It's watching God take something that seems like failure, that seems impossible, that seems like an obstacle, and use it for good, even if it doesn't turn out the way you and I would choose it to do because there's something bigger at play. And you get to play a part in that, he says. We get to play a part in that. Three years after Jim Elliott's death and those other missionaries, his wife Elizabeth, along with her three-year-old daughter and Rachel Saint, who is the wife of the pilot who was also killed, or the sister, rather, of the pilot, they travel to that same jungle and move in with the tribe. In fact, you can look this up. There's plenty of stories. Elizabeth has an incredible legacy of faith, her own, his wife, And there's home videos and pictures of their daughter swimming in the river with the the son of the man who killed her husband. Man. And two years later, after moving there, many of that tribe comes to place their faith in Christ. Not only because of the testimony and faithfulness of Elizabeth as she's moved in, but as the result of those men sacrificing their life See, God was up to something bigger. To this very day, we sit here and talk about Jim and Elizabeth Elliot and missionaries all around the world continue to run towards these places because of the life and legacy that they have left behind. What seemed to be an absolute utter failure has actually been used by God to multiply the mission across the globe and bring thousands, if not millions, to faith, including those that Jim felt so strongly called to. And so Jim went to save a village in Ecuador and what has happened as a result is God has taken that and he's multiplied that and it's now reaching all around the world. And what are you gonna do with the people he's placed in the front row of your life? Are you, are you gonna allow yourself to focus on the mission he's called you to so that you might lean into the joy he's offered you? Are you gonna view your circumstances differently? Are you gonna allow that to reframe them so you see these obstacles as opportunities? Are you gonna allow yourself to look at these things differently so you recognize that this moment that you are in is literally just a moment That God's love for you is beyond what you can even fathom. And while things may not turn out the way you'd hoped, there is a bigger picture at play. Are you gonna recognize the opportunity to reach those non-believers that he's placed in your life that in many ways, in many cases, you're the only one who'll be able to reach? Are you looking and taking notice of the believers around you so that you might encourage them through the way that you respond and react and live out your faith? Are you living and modeling the humility of Christ that Paul will refer to in chapter two where he lays aside the glory of heaven to come and pursue us? Because if you do, if you do, it will result and a lasting joy that this world cannot take from you. Because my friends, this broken, sinful, depraved, evil world will throw its worst at you. It will throw its very worst at you. And yet God has given us his best. 
so that we might not just survive this thing called life, but we would live it abundantly regardless of what life thinks it can throw. And you and I might live with a joy that no one can take away. And for some of you this morning, that is such a foreign concept, but something you long for. Never have you ever come to a place and moment where you have given your life to Jesus who's given his life for you. You stumbled in here hoping, desperately maybe, or questioning, or doubting, or not quite sure, but I don't know, but you're here. And you might think that to be a circumstance of chance, and yet I'm telling you, God has brought you here for this very moment and this very day and this very opportunity before you. And we would all beg you, we would beg you to give your life to him. Not for our sakes, but for yours, and not even for yours alone, but for his, that you might be a part of something bigger than yourself. That you might lean in and experience joy that you can't experience otherwise. And we talk about that here really simply in an ABC because that's, we like to keep it pretty simple, right? That you would admit to him that you need him, that the world is broken, that you are broken, that the, the harder we try to get it right, the more we seem to get wrong, that we are sinful ourselves, that we desperately need someone beyond us to come and rescue us and that you would be, believe that he is enough, that he loves you, he died for you, loves you now in your mess, not later when you get it cleaned up because you can't without him, that you would see, choose to commit and place your life in his hands and that you would follow him and be committed to the mission that he's called you to all your life, that you might enjoy life and life abundantly and experience the joy the apostle Paul tells us and reminds us is absolutely at your disposal through him and him alone. And others of you in these rooms this morning, you would sit and you say, man, I've got a little bit of mission drift. <laughs> I started strong, but I lost sight of it. And the obstacles have taken my focus and I've lost sight of the fact that there are opportunities. I've not been intentional with the mission that God has called me to be. I'm not being intentional with the believers that God has placed in my life. I'm not experiencing the joy he has because I've been living it for me and for me alone. And for us, I would say this, church, please, there's too much at risk for us to lose sight of the mission he's called us to. For our own sakes and for those around us, would we repent of that? Would we turn our face back to him? Would we take up the mantle of the mission and run together again towards the row, the row in front of us and the desert around us? Because this desert needs us because it needs Jesus. And we can scroll through Twitter and Victor Valley News and complain about how awfully depraved this place is, or we can run towards the darkness with a light that will never fade because Jesus is the hope of the gospel and the only hope that this place needs and can ever have. And so may we not be guilty of sitting on our dairy airs, scrolling and complaining, but rather run towards the darkness with a light that shines so brightly and give such joy and transformation. This mission he has called us to individually and as a church, and would we not be content to sit on the sidelines otherwise? Would we run with the same commitment and passion and dedication that Jim Elliott and these others have? And would we do so with every opportunity he gives us for the glory of God and the mission he's called us to? And we do so with such great joy, encouraging each other as we go. And never settle for less. Never settle for less. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. I'm grateful that for whatever reason you choose to use us. I'm grateful that your joy is available to us. And I pray over these rooms even now, God, for those who've never placed their faith in you would... Would they find it this morning, this joy in you and in you alone? For the believers here in these rooms, God, would we take up the mantle of the mission and would we run with incredible passion and dedication and calling and inexpressible, undescribable joy to those around us? Would we live with such a priority of the mission? 
that we might feel fulfilled in a way that only comes from you, that our lives would be lived abundantly, would, be, would we be willing to wade into the mess and the difficulty, knowing that on the other side is a savior so sweet and so worthy, a glory so great, that we would never trade anything for it. God, we give you this day and this week ahead. May we live it with the mission in mind, and it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.